Yeah, and so what I thought we'd uh, look at today is this idea of linking with the kind of the theme of the conference, the idea of kind of bookish learning and orality and literacy and things like this, um, to, to look a little bit about how variations in the level of Greco-Roman education that an ancient hero might have might affect the way they read uh, certain texts. Um, and so what I do, the first part of the paper really is a, uh, engaging with the work of Teresa Morgan and Raffaella Cribiori, uh, looking at education in antiquity and the range of authors and texts that you might have studied. And on the basis of that then, I, I, I invent a kind of a hypothetical hero in the second half of the paper, sort of an imaginary friend really, um, as to how they might read uh, texts in, in antiquity. So it's, it's a look, it's engaging with um, studies of education in the ancient world and thinking how might that help us understand the way texts might have been received in, um, in the first century really. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, so I'll partly read and I'll partly um, move on to various bits and pieces on the screen. So this paper aims to engage in an imaginative way with Greco-Roman education as a significant variable affecting how texts were heard and understood in antiquity. An ancient hearer's understanding of a particular text that was being read aloud was informed by the range of texts that she was already familiar with and carried with her as part of her mental library. And I'll come back later on and we can talk about this idea of mental library. Uh, this mental library shaped her pre-understanding and interacts with the new texts currently being delivered. Yet the contents of an ancient hearer's mental library will vary, depending, for example, upon the languages she speaks, the places she has lived, her gender, ethnicity, literary tastes and formal education. Uh, it's this last factor that will be the central focus of this paper. How might a person's level of formal Greek education shape and inform the contents of her mental library and in turn uh, influence her reception of ancient texts. So that's the, the, main, the main focus. We're going to look at how differing levels of education you'd have read and understood and, and engaged with different texts and how will that shape then the way you hear the new one that's being read. Um, so as I said, the first part will be engaging with Teresa Morgan and Raffaello Cribiori in terms of looking at Greco-Roman education. The second part, we're going to look at this hypothetical... Uh, no, no, okay. Uh, the second part will then be looking at uh, this idea of a mental library and different hero constructs. And the, the test case passage we'll be looking at is, is one I looked at really from my PhD thesis, Revelation chapter 9, uh, the fifth of uh, a series of seven trumpets uh, in Revelation 9, mostly because of the cosmological imagery in that, in that passage. So we'll, we'll come back and look at that later. So the first part of the, the paper... Um, I'm sure these, these texts are very familiar to you. Uh, so there's Raffaello Cribiori's work. Some of those are the Gymnastics of the Mind, where she engages with uh, education in the ancient world, some uh, studies with Roger Bagnall on women's uh, education, uh, and similarly, Theresa Morgan uh, on literary education in the Hellenistic and Roman worlds. And, and there's another, some useful tables from Morgan. I don't know, John, if you could pass those around as well for people to have a little look at. Again, this, I'm sure there's a lot of this material is very familiar. Um, so this section of the paper offers an overview of the progressive cycles of Greek encyclical education in the Greco-Roman era. Uh, attention is paid to the pedagogical goals of each cycle and the close correlation between educational attainment and socioeconomic status. Uh, so once this framework's in place, uh, the contents of Greek encyclical education are scrutinised. Which literary text did an ancient pupil study at various significant points on his or her educational journey? Uh, so we'll look at the kind of um, stages you would go through in terms of Greek education and, and the types of texts you might well be reading. Um, so if we move on then to this idea of, of encyclical education, and kuklios paideia, this kind of rounded or circular education, uh, so the scope of the educational process was visualised as the completion of a series of kind of circles of learning, which simultaneously illustrate the emphasis on recurrence in the process, that you come back again to the same texts and the same kind of principles uh, as you work your way through different stages. Uh, the content of Incuclius Paidia, as enumerated by prominent ancient educational theorists, notably Pseudo-Plutarch, Philo, Quintilian and Seneca, differ slightly around the edges, but cluster around a nucleus of constitutive subjects, uh, reading and writing, grammar, literature, genre, geometry, astronomy and music seem to be basic to it, rhetoric and dialectic usually come in, 
Uh, philosophy more often does not. That might be a kind of a later stage. Uh, completion of this kind of full circle of education uh, by Greco-Roman students involved a progression through three tiered levels of primary, secondary, and tertiary studies. And in recent decades, particularly following the studies of Morgan and Cribiori and others, um, there's kind of a greater fluidity. When you look at the ancient uh, texts, the surviving papyri and various fragments, uh, compared to what's said in the literary authors. But nonetheless, there does seem to be kind of various stages that you work your way through. Um, and so though a little bit more blurred than maybe the neat scheme you would get in some of the educational writers, uh, there do seem to be kind of different stages that you work your way through. Um, the goal of the primary circle of education uh, was to teach basic literacy and numeracy. Uh, students began by learning to read and write the alphabet, their own name, uh, before, before progressing in incremental stages through syllables, words and phrases of increasing length and difficulty. Um, evidence for these first tentative steps in literate education is provided by the numerous extant papyri remains of the alphabet, syllabaries and word lists from Greco-Roman Egypt, evidence of a variety of school hand competencies. And we saw yesterday in Joan Taylor's paper, she was looking at evidence of, of these abacadaries, these kind of alphabets in various uh, contexts and trying to understand whether they were educational or whether they were uh, more apotropaic in some way. Uh, so the pinnacle of the primary cycle of education was the copying, recitation, and memorization of short extracts from Greek literary authors, as well as innumerable short gnomic sayings or maxims. Uh, so that was the primary stage, really, emphasis on kind of literacy and numeracy. Uh, the most striking distinction then, when you move from the primary to the secondary, uh, was not so much in the range of texts uh, that you looked at, because often similar authors come back and you look at them again, uh, but rather the method, this kind of grammatical study that was taught to enable students to study these poetic authors critically. Uh, one of the earliest extant grammar textbooks is the influential work by the Alexandrian grammarian Dionysius Thrax, probably late, first century, uh, late second century BCE. Uh, he wrote a short treatise entitled Technae Grammaticae, setting out the technical elements of grammatical study. And again, as I'm sure many of you are very uh, familiar with this. So the first stage is emphasis on kind of literacy and numeracy. The second stage was more the study, kind of the study, critical study of poetic texts and authors. Um, the third stage then, the kind of the goal of the complete circle of education uh, was principally identified with formal training in rhetoric. Uh, but before a student was trained in the art of persuasive speech, he, was, he or she was first given a firm grounding in prose compositional exercises, something that, uh, for example, Sean's looked at in detail for, for Luke, Luke Axe. Uh, the earliest extant handbook of prose compositional exercises, uh, Pro Gymnasmata, dates from around 50 to 100 CE and is attributed to the Alexandrian author Aelius Theon. Uh, the student is taken through an ordered progression of compositional exercises, commencing with shorter and simpler tasks, uh, for example, writing and rewriting fables, uh, which become progressively longer and more complicated uh, with time and practice in preparation for the careful structuring of an extended speech. So completion of the circle of Encuclius Paedia prepared an elite minority of students for an oratorical career in law or politics. Most of the students who embarked on a Greek literary education, however, would have little expectation of attaining such a goal. Instead, students terminated their circuit at a vast array of differing points along the circumference and with a corresponding variety of educational achievements. So although there was these three stages of education uh, with the goal of kind of rhetorical education at the end, it was only a small minority who got through to the very final stages. Uh, instead of that, you would have different students, the majority kind of having a much lower level uh, and kind of terminating at different points along the cycle. Uh, the vast majority attained merely a basic level of literacy, the primary cycle. A smaller group gained an acquaintance with literary classics, notably Homer, and some tools of literary analysis at the secondary level. A still smaller minority learnt basic compositional skills, pro gymnasmata, uh, whilst a tiny proportion received a formal rhetorical education. Uh, so this idea of the, the Greek encyclical education in different stages, uh, just because you embark on the circle doesn't mean you're going to get to the very end. Uh, you may terminate your circle at various different points. Um, and that's something uh, that I look at in terms of this kind of hypothetical hearer construct. You can then have a whole range of different models of an ancient hearer uh, that terminate the kind of education at different points. What might they have studied at those various uh, different stages? Uh, the next section is going to look a little bit at which authors did people uh, read or study at, at 
different stages of education. And as I said, I'm drawing on particularly the study of Theresa Morgan and the tables I've handed out to you uh, there. We're drawing on Greco-Roman Egypt and the papyri. Um, and obviously there's different ways in which you can try and understand how do we reconstruct uh, what texts did people read or study? And James was talking yesterday about um, texts in different, you know, surviving kind of almost library collections. So there's, there's lots of different ways of, of doing it. But what I've looked at really here is, is drawn on Theresa Morgan and what survived from Greco-Roman Egypt, which does raise questions as to how uh, representative uh, the extant papyri remains are. Um, the other way of, of, of engaging with this is also to look at literary authors and which texts they allude to. So there's, there's ranges of different ways of, of doing this. Uh, but nonetheless, drawing on the evidence we got from the surviving papyri, uh, picked out in a number of those tables that you've got there, which were the kind of most popular authors? Which authors have we got the most number of fragments surviving in school hands? Uh, based on handwriting, based on uh, the line ruling and various things, trying to work out which were school text exercises. Uh, of the surviving uh, extracts, the vast majority are portions of three uh, major authors. So I think if you look at the table, I'll mention it to you, in particular page uh, 313, table 15 in, in Morgan's uh, study, uh, is really, this is the section I'm drawing on at this point, uh, in terms of the, the huge number of texts surviving from Homer, uh, Euripides, and then to a lesser extent Menander, as being kind of representative of the sorts of texts you would read. Um, the predominant position of the epic poetry of Homer in Greco-Roman literature is amply attested by the sheer volume of extant extracts of his work that survive in the school text Papari, accounting for approximately half of the total number of fragments of named literary authors. The surviving fragments exemplify a range of school hand proficiencies, from poor to middling to good, which suggests that Homeric extracts were utilised across a broad range of educational levels. Uh, in addition to demonstrating Homer's preeminence and widespread use at each stage of the educational cycle, the papyri also illuminate the relative popularity of specific sections within the Homeric corpus. Um, and some of the earlier tables you can flick through there give more detail on uh, the number of fragments of the Iliad and the Odyssey surviving, which books of the Iliad and the Odyssey seem to be more popular. And on the basis, again, of that evidence, uh, perhaps the most striking statistic is that the Iliad was significantly more popular than the Odyssey at a ratio of approximately six to one in terms of surviving fragments. Similarly, the opening books of each work were by far the most popular, with six of the 11 school hand fragments of the Odyssey deriving from books one to five, and no fewer than 35 of the 66 excerpts from the Iliad containing portions of books one to two. So these figures strongly suggest that ancient primary and early secondary level students were more likely to be familiar with books one to two of the Iliad than any other ancient text. Uh, some of the most popular extracts from this section of the Iliad were the catalogue of ships that surveyed the principal characters in the drama, as well as the deceptive dream that Zeus sent to Agamemnon. Um, if you were to progress on through later stages in the educational cycle, you would return again and again uh, to Homer in much more detail uh, beyond those kind of early chapters. The, the second kind of key author then is Euripides. The substantial number of extant school text fragments of the plays of the Athenian tragedy in Euripides, approximately 20 in total, place this playwright second only to Homer in popularity and far outweighing the totals of Aeschylus and, and Sophocles. Um, and again, there's a range of uh, school hands in which these fragments survive, and similarly, uh, different types of fragment in terms of length and function. Um, a number of them being kind of gnomic sayings, others more lengthy extracts. Uh, of the plays of Euripides, uh, again, in one of the tables we've got from Cribiori, on page 321, table 22, uh, Yeah, so again, she's got a range of uh, details of different texts that survive in different periods uh, of, of Euripides. And again, the, by far the most popular was the Phoenician women uh, in our period, in the kind of uh, Greco-Roman period. Uh, and the Cribio then wrote a kind of a, a, an article as to why that might be, picking up a number of reasons how this text could have been used at primary, secondary and tertiary level in a range of different ways. Um, that it had a whole series of kind of quotable maxims for the early stages, uh, rare and complex words that secondary students could grapple with, um, as well as the rhetorical skill of the work as a whole for, for tertiary level students. 
Uh, finally, then, the, the other key literary author that uh, students may well have engaged with from the primary level on would have been Menander. Uh, seven brief fragments of his comedies are extant, mostly in a middling or good hand, uh, with an even more widespread range of quotations uh, extant in the abundant collection of Nomai, these kind of maxims that survive. So students, especially at the primary and secondary level, would be far more familiar with memorable one-liners from Menander's comedies than they would be with the actual plots or characters of the plays themselves. Um, <clears throat> and again, this gets picked up at later levels in terms of writing out extracts or the, the kind of valorization of it by Quintilian in the Institutes of Oratory, Book 10, uh, as a particularly speeching character, something for orators to imitate when they're, they're adopting characters in their, in their speeches. Uh, so the extant Greco-Roman school text papyri suggests that for the majority of pupils who terminated their circuit at the primary or early secondary stage, their literary education consisted of a limited knowledge of portions of three genres, epic, tragedy, and these kind of gnomic sayings. Homer, notably Iliad, books one to two, some extracts from Euripides, perhaps most notably the Phoenician women, and some maxims or gnomic sayings often attributed to Menander. Uh, so I don't know if you can see if that's come out on the screen. Um, so this kind of idea of, if you're looking at trying to reconstruct what did ancient uh, students study, what kind of text did they know, it depends really how far they got round the educational circle. And some of um, the students who only got kind of a short way into kind of basic literacy, the, the kind of range of authors they may have studied or read could have been quite uh, limited to, to kind of little bits from Homer, Euripides, and some, some maxims. Uh, what about then the, the secondary level? And I said the, the focus in the second part of this paper will be looking at Revelation 9 and some of the cosmological uh, language. So I've deliberately skewed this bit of the discussion of secondary level to focus on Aratus uh, as someone that, that students would have uh, studied. And there's some images on uh, the handout I gave you originally with the little circles on. On page two of that, there's an image of the Mainz celestial glow we'll, we'll mention in a moment. Uh, so it's always good to have pictures. I thought Saturday morning, we need pictures. That's what we need at this stage. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so a distinguishing mark of a grammatical level education, uh, as we've mentioned before, was this kind of study of a method. How do you study poetic texts? Uh, but also something they'd have engaged with at that stage uh, was Aratus's epic poem, The Phenomena. Uh, Aratus of Soli in Cilicia was a Hellenistic philosopher and poet uh, who seems to have studied under Zeno, the founder of the Stoic philosophical school. The first half of Aratus's phenomena is essentially a, a kind of a reworking in epic poetry uh, of a, an earlier prose version of um, Eudoxus that was sh kind of describing all the different constellations. Uh, so we turned that into a, an epic poem, which became very uh, popular and well, well read. Uh, so the text offered a detailed description of the relative positions of the fixed stars or constellations on the celestial sphere. Uh, the final section was, was on observable weather signs. Uh, the net result was kind of an updated version of Hesiod's uh, Works and Days, offering practical advice on how to prosper in life through careful scrutiny of calendrical and weather signs. And Aratus's phenomena was, was phenomenally, uh, there's a slight pun there for John, uh, phenomenally well received in Hellenistic <laughs> and Roman eras, uh, and was to prove the most popular introduction to astronomy that elite students received in the formal circle of education. Um, so sometimes it was studied uh, as a work of epic poetry. Other times there was more of an emphasis on it as a, from, as a mathematical or something to study as a kind of an astronomical text. So it varied a little. But certainly it was very highly valued as, as a, work, a work of epic. Um, and sometimes it, there's references in, in some of the, the writings to students using kind of these um, celestial globes when they were studying uh, texts like that, when they were studying Aratus and some other writers. Um, there's only two or three of these uh, celestial globes surviving uh, now from antiquity. Uh, and this is the, the closest kind of one, the Mainz celestial uh, globe, which is only 11 centimetres in, in diameter. It seems to have originally been uh, on the top of a sundial, so I don't think this was necessarily used in, uh, in a school uh, context, but we've only got two others surviving. One of them is a huge one uh, on the Farnese atlas. Uh, so this is the kind of closest type of celestial globe that may have been uh, used by students uh, to engage with these texts, having these depictions of the Greek constellations and then the epic poem of Aratus, uh, uh, describing those in more detail. So we'll come back to the Aratus and the celestial globe 
uh, later. So that was something you may do at your secondary level. Uh, the tertiary level then, how would the range of texts you'd studied varied from the very low level of, of writers, maybe a little bit of Homer, a little bit of Euripides uh, you'd studied? Again, all sorts of different ways of, of reconstructing that. What I've referred to on the handout I've given you, on the, back on the front page, uh, was uh, the reading list that Quintilian uh, set out in Book 10 of the Institutes of Oratory, late first century uh, Roman uh, orator. And again, this is going to be a maximal list, a bit like the reading lists I'm sure we all hand out. We think we're not expecting the students to have worked through all of these, uh, but a kind of a maximal list of someone who's very well educated. These are the range of genres, the range of authors. And you see Eratus ends up under the epic uh, kind of genre uh, in, that, in that text. So it's just giving you a sense of, uh, as, as Sean was talking earlier as well, that the, the kind of elite... Um, people from the elite strata of society who were attending symposia or reading symposia, uh, the range of authors that they'd read, access to, to libraries, uh, there could be a huge gulf between someone at a very educated level and someone who's just got basic literacy, the range of authors. They might both say they've read Homer, but it could be quite different in extent uh, as to what that could be. Um, and also you've got this idea of boundary markers that, that can come across quite quite clearly if you're um, engaging with particular literary texts or engaging in dialogue with, with an educated person, that there's text they're going to refer to you've not come across. If you've only studied the, the, the kind of primary or secondary level, uh, not simply named authors, but whole genres of texts, you tended to be the, the more prose texts so as you work through to the tertiary level. So even if you've read kind of historical, oratorical, philosophical authors, that's already given a sense of how far you've got uh, through this cycle. Uh, so a very limited core of literary texts uh, would have been familiar to almost all students who embarked on the circle of literary education, principally Homer, but also Euripides and Menander. Uh, the recurrent nature of the system was such that students continually returned to the elements, that's the core authors and principles, that they'd met from the very beginning. Yet the continuities were often far outweighed by the discontinuities in that the breadth of an ancient student's knowledge of these texts whereas a primary educated student may have some knowledge of the Iliad books one to two that she's attempted to read, copy, and memorize, a tertiary educated student is likely to be familiar with the Iliad and Odyssey in their entirety through repeated critical engagement honed by the tools of grammatical study. So there can be a great gulf, even if you've read Homer, it's how, to what extent have you read it, what kind of methods have you used to study uh, this author. So the first part of the paper really, as, as you'll all be familiar, is, is really having engaged with material that's out there by Cribiori and Morgan and others on what, what do we know about ancient education, what texts did student studies, how can we kind of reconstruct that. Uh, the second part is a slightly more hypothetical hero construct idea. It, it's a more imaginative way of, of engaging with this. And what I was doing through the thesis and, and slightly later has been to look at uh, the Book of Revel Revelation and its early reception history. Um, and how might early kind of, uh, audiences, early hearers of this text have, have understood it? Um, and to, to put things very basically, well, it will depend a little bit on what they're bringing to the text. What text do they already know? What text have they read? Uh, and so what I've looked at in, in both the thesis and in, in some other bits and pieces I've written since has been to look at, well, what about education as a key variable? Uh, given what we know now about ancient education, how would someone's understanding of this text change if they've had a primary education, a secondary education, a tertiary education, um, and playing around with that um, a little bit in various different ways. And this is where this idea of a mental library uh, comes in. And in a way, it could be an interesting kind of topic to think about in relation to this orality and literacy. So as well as these kind of written texts that we talk about, once students have studied texts, either through education or just through their own repeated uh, hearing of these texts, um, there's a sense in which they become internalized and part of their own kind of mental library that they carry with them. Uh, so when they hear a new text being read aloud, uh, certain triggers that can, that can get them to, to pick those up. Uh, so we talk a little bit now about uh, mental libraries. How would I define a mental library? Uh, so the term mental library is a shorthand way of referring to the texts or portions of texts that an ancient hearer retained in her memory, however imperfectly, as a consequence of recurrent hearing, and which she may recall on the basis of verbal echoes of the present text currently being performed. So in, in this instance, we're going to look at Revelation 9. Uh, the precise contents of this hearer's mental library uh, will closely correspond to a plausible range of literary texts that such an ancient hero may, might have studied as part of a Greek encyclical education. Uh, 
Uh, the aim is to create a plausible model of an ancient hearer with a specified set of literary texts consistent with their educational attainment uh, with the requisite exegetical method that's appropriate for the period in which the hearer is situated and the degree of her literary competence. So what I've done, not in huge detail today, but in other things I've written, is try to look at, I'm not going to come up with a properly rounded uh, human being, it's a very much a, a 2D kind of person, uh, that what they are really is a set of texts and a set of methods. So those texts that we can plausibly say someone would have read at a certain level of education, and with a method that's consistent with their education or the, uh, the period, how might they then engage uh, with this other writing? Um, there's some other, I didn't put it sadly on your bibliography, but some of the more recent studies as well of Peter Oakes, who does very, very subtle kind of sociological models, and Jason and Penelope read Philippians 1 to 11. Bridget wouldn't let me give my people names, um, but it was probably wise. It was probably wise. It's a hero construct is what they call. They're more like robots, because uh, they're not really properly rounded people. So it's probably best I don't give them names. Um, and so, so that we've seen that one already. Uh, so this is my med up here that we're going to look at uh, for the second part, um, which I use colours, which mean you can't read it, I think, helpfully. <laughs> sort of dark blue on black. Um, but what, essentially it was a kind of a tertiary uh, level here. In a, in a way, in the, the thesis, I looked at a, a primary level and a tertiary level. I also gave them some scriptural texts as well. Um, but for the, for the sake of this, I, I've just given them some text they might have studied at a tertiary level. So we've got here a construct, HC. Uh, they've had a, prior, a tertiary level Greek education. So what have they done? They, they've read a little bit of Homer, Iliad and Odyssey, Menander, uh, Hesiod, Theogony and Works and Days, uh, some Euripides, uh, Aratus's Phenomena, studied with the aid of a celestial globe. So that was the, the, the bit from earlier that comes back in, crowbarred back in now. Uh, and also prose authors, I, I gave them Plato's Timaeus to make my life easier uh, for this section because I wanted them to have a certain uh, cosmological knowledge. Uh, and as I invented them, I thought I could do what I wanted with them. Um, uh, so this idea of what was then their pre-understanding based on the education they've had, um, they're going to engage now with Revelation 9, which is that's kind of a strange text. I've put it on the, the handout. We can have a look at in a moment. Um, but just thinking of it cosmologically, what you have in the book of Revelation is a very much a kind of an archaic uh, tripartite model of the universe. There's heaven, there's earth, there's under the earth. It's a very kind of three-level universe. Um, whereas this person, my made-up hero construct, um, has had a better education. They've read Plato's Timaeus. They've read Aratus. Uh, they have a sense of the universe really isn't like that. Um, that. It's really made up of these kind of seven planetary spheres. So what do they do when they come across a text like Revelation 9? How do they read it? on the basis of their uh, education. And I go into this in a little bit more detail in, in the book if anyone is, is interested. But the, I partly use Philo as an analogy of someone doing this, someone with a good education reading a text uh, with a kind of an outdated cosmology. How do you engage with it? And again, Philo uh, tended then in De Proficio Mundi to read the Genesis creation narratives through the lens of his own uh, cosmology, saying re reading this text correctly, really this is how it should be understood. Um, it's doing all that's in the best of up-to-date uh, scientific knowledge. So interpreted correctly uh, in that sense, using an allegorical exegetical approach, the hero construct will endeavor to reread Revelation 9 in conformity with this kind of middle platonic seven planetary spheres cosmology ornamented with the Aratine constellations. Uh, so they're going to read Revelation 9. They've had this particular level of education, so they've already got a view of how the world is, uh, and they're going to reread Revelation 9 in that, in that context. Um, so I think on the little handout, I've given you Revelation 9. Uh, probably not everyone's favorite bedtime reading. You may not be immediately familiar with it. Um, so what's Revelation 9 about? Essentially, it's, it's part way through uh, the seven trumpet cycle, so the, the world is sort of fairly falling apart around everyone at this stage. Um, so it's a series of seven kind of plague, trumpet plagues, that occur at this point in the narrative from chapter, two, uh, chapter 8, verse 2 through to 1119. Uh, the first four trumpet blasts had signaled the cosmological disorder and destruction as plagues of hail, fire, and blood rained down on the terrestrial realm, destroying a third of the vegetation and sea creatures, poisoning a third of the waters, and darkening a third of the celestial illuminations. And this also points forward to Trumpet 6, in which a third of humanity is annihilated. Um, so Revelation 5, um, again, it's a very kind of cosmological passage where you've got this three-tier universe. Uh, you've got this angelic functionary, this star that descends from heaven to earth uh, with a key. 
that unlocks the, the well of the abyss, this kind of access point to the underworld. And this releases a nightmarish nest of abyssal locusts uh, commissioned to torture unsealed humanity for five months. Um, and again, if you read it in the light of uh, scriptural text, what you're, you're getting really here in terms of echoes of earlier texts is a rereading of Joel, Joel, Prophet Joel chapters 1 to 2, with this idea of a locust army. And Joel 1 to 2 in its turn was a rereading of Exodus 10 and the, and the Exodus plagues. Uh, so often, and there's all sorts of studies, uh, for example, John Strazicic, looking at Joel's use of scripture and scripture's use of Joel, uh, all sorts of studies that have looked at use of scripture in Revelation 9 as a reworking of Joel, which was a reworking of Exodus. Uh, but in the case of my made-up hearer, he hasn't even read any of those texts, so he can't possibly hear them being echoed. Um, he's got a very limited uh, background knowledge, and he also wants to read this text, the cosmology of this text, in the light of his own educational background. Um, and so what I'm going to get him to do um, is, <laughs> is to read it as a kind of constellational figures. Uh, so hopefully you'll be able to see the next image. Uh, so that, sorry, that was Aratus from earlier. Um, and that was the Greek constellation, just to remind us. Revelation 9. Okay, so what am I going to get him to do, this, this med up here? Right? Um, Revelation 9, if you see the passage, if you have the passage in front of you... Um, it talks about these locusts coming out of the abyss, these kind of hybrid monsters with uh, lion's teeth and women's hair and a scorpion tail. Uh, and so what I, uh, what I understood my hearer might do is to try and read this in the light of the text he knows. So he's reading it as really being about constellations in the light of Aratus, um, and that those uh, kind of abyssal locusts are really a kind of composite of three constellations. Uh, of Leo, Parthenos, and Scorpion. Um, so the first constellation, Leon, supplies the fearsome jaws of this celestial hybrid. Uh, the human head, specifically its face and its hair, like women's hair, derived from the succeeding constellation on the ecliptic, Parthenos, and the tail end of the constellation is provided by the Scorpion constellation. They have tails like scorpions with stings. Um, and so following that, uh, what I then have this hearer do is to reread Revelation 9 as a kind of a constellational text, a bit like you get in Eratus. Uh, so it catastorizes uh, these, these kind of hybrid monsters. It's really a tale about these kind of constellations and of cosmic destruction. Um, so the Leonine teeth correspond to the constellation Leon. Uh, the seasonal significance of this constellation as an indicator of the burning heat of high summer in the Roman month of Julius uh, is often to this kind of destruction of vegetation and crops, but that's undercut within the text of Revelation 9 in which the, these kind of locust creatures are expressly forbidden to harm any vegetation. Um, the next portion, this kind of female face and hair, corresponds to, to Parthenos, um, resonant with the retributive justice of the goddess Dike, again echoing Aratus's uh, phenomena, where he interprets um, this constellation as the figure of justice, Dike, um, who left humanity because of all its injustices and goes up to the heavens and becomes the constellation Parthenos. And before she did so, before she left in a hump uh, at what humanity was doing, echoing bits from Hesiod, um, there's this description of the, the divine justice that will, divine retribution that will occur as a result of humanity's injustice. Um, and this is a line from Hesiod. But to those who care only for evil outrageousness and cruel deeds, far-seeing Zeus, Cronus's son, marks out justice. Upon them, Cronus' son brings forth woe from the sky, famine together with pestilence. And then the final part, so how will this kind of uh, eschatological destruction occur, uh, that's in relation to this uh, scorpion figure, this kind of last of the constellations, the scorpion sting. And again, that echoes a passage within Aratus's uh, phenomena where he describes uh, how is it that every time the, the constellation of scorpion arises, Orion goes underneath the horizon. And it's this description of the scorpion as this kind of chthonic subterranean monster that, that kills Orion. Uh, so again, you've got this image of a constellation of scorpion being linked with this underworld kind of scorpion figures. So my hero construct allegorically reinterprets Revelation 9, 1 to 12 uh, into a constellational tale. The abyssal locusts are catasterized uh, turned into constellations, such that the movement of the constellations Leon, Parthenos, and Scorpios are reread as astronomical signs of eschatological destruction, uh, misery from he heaven, echoing Aratus and Hesiod. 
taking the form of divine retribution against the injustices of humanity. Um, and at this point, I can, I can see in your eyes, you're thinking, this, this, no one would have done this in the ancient world. This is all madness. Um, and so I've got, the closest I could get was someone in the third century, which is the, the other element on your... Uh, uh, did I put it on your passage? Oh, no, there's a little image on page three. Uh, so the closest we've got, it is later, so it's third century from Hippolytus, uh, talking about what people were getting up to and people he didn't like very much uh, in the Refutation of All Heresies, book four, sections 46 to 50. Um, and he's quite critical of a writer who's using uh, these kind of constellational images and rewriting, rewriting the narratives in, by using scripture. Um, and he's not very pleased with them. This is from Refutation, book four, 46.2. Um, and what, he, what Hippolytus does is refer to Aratus and say, well, look, these are what they re are really about. It's not really uh, scriptural tales at all. In order that what I'm going to say, this is quoting Hippolytus, in order that what I'm going to say may appear clearer to my readers, I've decided to discuss the thoughts of Aratus on the disposition of the stars in heaven. How certain people allegorize those thoughts by transferring the celestial likenesses, i.e. the constellations, um, to what is said in Holy Scripture, so showing a strange marvel how their own sayings have been catasterized. Uh, so there was someone getting up to this type of thing in the third century that Hippolytus wasn't very keen on. Um, and I wonder whether what might be happening at that point is perhaps uh, someone using this kind of text that was quite prominent uh, a secondary level kind of grammatical education and maybe trying to rewrite it in a Christian way so to change the, the constellational stories so they're not about Greek constellations and Greek myths uh, but they're about scriptural stories and one of the ones that survives um, relates to the, the constellation on the top so do you see the little character who's upside down with the club in one hand and um, so in this passage, one of the ones that, that survives, the interpreter uh, interprets that figure, who's normally either not identified or people struggle to identify him as some sort of monster killer. Um, he identifies that as Adam with his foot on the dragon, which is his foot on Satan, while, uh, his arms outstretched in the confession of sins, one arm stretching towards uh, the Stephanos, the crown, uh, and the other towards the lyre, this kind of harmony in the cosmos. So it's used as a tale of how do you live your life? Uh, you live in harmony with the cosmos and you'll get this crown uh, pressing down these kind of uh, demonic forces. Um, so although, as I said, I haven't found anyone exactly in the first century doing this type of thing, I did at least find someone in the third century who might do something like that. Uh, so just a very brief uh, conclusion. Um, this paper has sketched the range and extent of literary authors that Greco-Roman students typically became acquainted with at various stages of a Greek encyclical education. A smattering of Homer, Euripides, and Menander at the primary level, followed by training in grammatical exegesis at the secondary level, before engaging with prose authors and compositional exercises at the tertiary level. Uh, whilst both the primary and tertiary educated student may share a familiarity with Homer, the extent, depth, and methodological insights are likely to diverge. Uh, the test case example offered an imaginative engagement with this educational material by outlining how the contents of an ancient hero's mental library may shape their pre-understanding uh, and the verbal echoes that a hero might choose to exploit in the interpretation of an ancient text. Uh, the sketch for this paper was deliberately broad brush, suggesting potential parallels with Aratus and Hesiod based on some slight verbal echoes, the word scorpion and... Kentron, and there wasn't a lot there. Uh, guided by the hero constructs pre-understanding of the cosmos along platonic lines. Uh, so it wasn't so much they were guided by the verbal echoes, but once they decided to interpret it in a certain way, there were some echoes there. Um, and so then one point I wanted to, to kind of end on was that thinking aloud about this idea of hero constructs with a, with a particular mental library. Because um, often what we look at in terms of echoes of text is working from the author's way around. What texts seem to be kind of alluded to? Are there strong verbal echoes of particular texts? Uh, but what about if we work from the reader hearer perspective round? What texts do they already know? And on what basis might they pick things up? Because um, once you've put a set of texts in their mental library, how do you then decide? Because obviously I was very aware when I was doing these sorts of things, I could kind of do what I liked with them. But how do you have a little bit more control, a little bit more plausibility with it? How do you decide which texts uh, an ancient hero might, might pick up? And I've got a couple of points that might be worth bearing in mind. One is this idea of pre-existing interpretive connections, that it isn't uh, just necessarily that if you hear verbal echoes of one text, 
uh, that that's the only thing you hear, that there may already be connections between texts within your mental library. Uh, to use a kind of visual image, um, it might be that you have uh, certain texts with others already rolled up inside them. There's already connections there. So when you hear one, it brings other things with it. The second, particularly for texts like Book of Revelation, is the effective force of the verbal imagery. Uh, so what might encourage you to hear echoes of Joel or hear echoes of Aratus might be the, the kind of the effective force that these kind of weird images of monsters and hybrids stay in your mind longer and are easier to trigger uh, than other things. And certainly we know from studies of memory, uh, the memory Loki, for example, in the Rhetorica ad Herenium, this idea of, of images that are striking and odd and disturbing in some way, are ones that would retain longer in the memory. So I think this idea of mental libraries of ancient heroes is not simply what's in them, but on what basis do we see how would they recall them, what makes that plausible, that I would look at a little bit more as well. So thank you very much.